Thank you so very much, Katie, for such a flattering introduction. And I want to thank the Board of Directors and members Nicole for inviting me uh, to be with you today. I was both surprised and uh, honored when you invited me to addre address this uh, distinguished group. I was surprised because when I retired just a little more than a year ago, I fully expected never to be heard from again, let alone being invited to give a keynote address uh, to a distinguished group such as this one. And I was honored because I so admire and appreciate the work that all of you do at Nicole, and you do it so well. It's hugely important to the communities that you serve, to the larger society that we all inhabit, and on a strictly personal note, to the many judges like myself who draw the assignment of overseeing these important cases, sometimes in one of my cases for as long as 17 years of oversight. You know, the phrase to protect and serve is a statement that has been adopted as the motto of, for the majority of police departments in the United States. The history behind this famous phrase has its origins in my hometown of Los Angeles as the motto of the Los Angeles Police Department. In recent months and years, however, our country has been forced to question what this motto actually means. I hear people saying, just who is it that is being protected? or just who is it that is being served. In a nation that prides itself on the illuminating beacons that go by the names of democracy and freedom, the phrase has established distrust and a lack of safety amongst much of our citizenry. With the help of a vigilant media, the actions of police departments as well as individual officers are facing as great a, deal, a great deal more scrutiny these days. A closer look is being taken. More transparency is being demanded. More community control is being sought. In turn, this has caused a great deal of pressure for reform, not only for police departments, but for the American social justice system as well. Those of you in attendance at this conference as you engage in your training, your reporting, your oversight, and various other roles are critical in our efforts to create a society in which the state serves and protects all of our citizens, no matter their color or their gender, their economic status, or the neighborhood in which they live. Three weeks ago, I attended a reunion in San Francisco with the law clerks that I've worked with for the past 37 years. It was truly a wonderful event, the equivalent of a family reunion, as some came with their spouses, some came with their children, to celebrate and remember what we've accomplished together over the past 37 years. Some had to travel only a few miles to get there, and others came from as far away as Switzerland. Some were meeting, nearing their own retirement. Some were just beginning their promising careers. I open our remarks to them by admitting the obvious, that I could not have done my job remotely as well as I did without them. That their commitment to working long days and frequent weekends to make certain we were getting it right was the reason that I get introductions like the one Katie uh, graced upon me here tonight. And I can honestly tell all of you that with respect to some of the biggest and the most important cases that I've presided over, I could not possibly have done justice to the parties in those cases without the dedication, the expertise, and personal commitment of those of you who not only served as my eyes and ears in the field, but also as my wise, battle-hardened, and learned counselors, advisors, and teachers, even as you ever so patiently held my hand and explained and clarified the on-the-ground realities of police work. Federal judges are of necessity generalists. 
We hear cases involving complicated patents, constitutional issues, antitrust, immigration, drug conspiracies, securities regulation, and on and on. In all, we cover 17 different areas of federal constitutional and statutory law. We can't possibly master this vast area of federal law. And this is the very reason, in certain types of cases that involve police oversight or prison oversight, your experience, your expertise, and your background are so very vital to us judges as we collaborate to develop strategies to bring parties into compliance. The job you have is almost definitely not an easy one. And lay, and it, at least in my experience, can take several years to finish a single case. But I want to stop for a second and I want to ask ourselves an important question. Why is it usually so difficult to achieve compliance in any particular case? Defendants most certainly aren't being asked to adhere to some radical or experimental or new concept of policing. For the most part, they're simply being asked to learn and you're tasked with monitoring what are quite simply the best practices in the trade, being employed by just about every metropolitan police force in the country. So then, what's the problem? Let's take a look at one of my cases to see if it affords us any additional insights. And as we do, I want you to know that I'm fully aware of the rules of confidentiality and judicial discretion. And everything I say will be said with that in mind. In the year 2000, some 18 years ago, Delphine Allen, Allen filed a Section 1983 action case against the city of Oakland, California and its police department alleging that a group of rogue police officers who became known as the Riders had violated plaintiff's constitutional rights by kidnapping, beating, planting drugs, illegally breaking and entering into homes of plaintiffs and others similarly situated. In all, there were 119 plaintiffs in this action. Prior to undertaking the extremely prolonged and prohibitively expensive process of trial, with all of the discovery and the investigation, the pretrial motions, etc., the parties, and that was with the court's very strong encouragement, agreed to begin with settlement discussions to try to settle the case. And I assigned one of our magistrate judges to spend as much time as needed on this case to help them reach a settlement. Roughly 18 long months later and many conferences with the magistrate judge and with the court, a settlement was reached. And a few months after that, after a lengthy court hearing to ensure that there were no surprises, that everyone understood what they were doing, I approved the negotiated settlement agreement or the NSA. The NSA called for plaintiffs to receive $10.9 million, which was to be distributed to the plaintiff class pursuant to an agreed upon formula. Much more importantly, the parties agreed to implement numerous reforms of, to the OPD practices, policies, and procedures to ensure that these types of police abuses would not happen again. These reforms were, be, were to be completed and the OPD was to be in complete compliance within five years and they concluded such straightforward things as improved training techniques and practices, improved internal affairs investigations, improved disciplinary practices, better field supervision, closer management oversight. Simply put, the reforms called for the OPT to start doing what virtually every properly run police force in the country is doing on a daily basis. After approving the settlement, 
I ordered the plaintiffs and the defendants to get together and select a monitoring team to oversee the reform implementation process. The monitoring team selected by the parties was an excellent one. It consisted of some civil rights attorneys, a Justice Department recently uh, retired uh, attorney, a community activist, and a former law enforcement officer. And they began working with great enthusiasm and I think even greater optimism. What could possibly go wrong? After all, the defendants had agreed to all of the changes and they were clearly doable. However, despite everyone's seemingly best efforts, in June of 2008, when the five-year period of the NSA had expired, the Oakland Police Department was far from being in full compliance and the party stipulated to two additional years uh, to get it done. Because the contract the city had with the monitoring team had also expired, the city seized this opportunity to try and rid themselves of this particular monitoring team because as they had been, because, uh, as they had been constantly complaining to me, the monitors were too tough on them, too hard to satisfy. They didn't fully understand what policemen were expected to do and they needed uh, more former policemen on the monitoring team, I was told, who understood how policing really works. Well, as the saying goes, be careful of what you ask for. You just might get it. You want more former policemen? How about, oh, excuse me. How about a monitoring team led by Robert Warshaw? former chief of the Rochester, New York Police Department, former deputy drug czar of the White House Office of International Drug Control, auditor for the U.S. Department of Justice in reviewing compliance with procedural revisions ordered by federal judges from around the country. You want more police to oversee you? How about Warshaw's top sidekick, Charlie Reynolds, himself a former police chief? oversight auditor, former Nicole Flame awardee, by the way, and I understand that uh, Charlie's somewhere in the audience uh, tonight. And so, hi, Charlie. Uh, we miss you out here in California. So is that enough? Really knowledgeable oversight for you? And as an aside, I ought to mention that over the course of this difficult case, Oakland has had 10 police chiefs and four of those chiefs, upon assuming the job and becoming familiar with the task his department was being asked to perform, assured me in open court and on the record that they would be in compliance within nine to 12 months. I think nothing tells more than this, that compliance is indeed achievable If only the will to change is there. That's important. If the will to change is there to do it. In September of 2011, the Warshaw Reynolds team filed a report attributing the lack of progress to a failure of defendants to take the litigation seriously. They were determined to simply outsit the monitors and the monitoring process. To serve and defend. Just imagine the complete disservice this does to that community. Not only do they have a police department and a city government which doesn't take its own settlement agreement seriously, but that is also wasting millions and millions of much needed revenue in the process. Not to mention the continuing subpar police service for the citizenry of that community. Finally, the plaintiff's attorneys out of sheer frustration asked for permission 
to file a motion to put the OPD into receivership. I'm pretty sure they did this because in another of my big institutional cases, I had put the medical portion of the entire California prison system under receivership. So there was a precedent for putting a group in the, under receivership. And although I had privately given some thought to appointing receiver for the Allen case, I just wasn't confident that it was appropriate in this particular case. Taking over a paramilitary type organization such as a police department, which is so vitally essential to the well-being and safety of our citizens, is considerably different from taking over a medical delivery system in a prison setting, and especially so when your medical receiver is not given authority over the custodial decisions of the prison. That is left to the warden, and the, the doctor's powers are strictly limited to medical care. Nonetheless, I was pretty well aware of my reputation when it came to insisting that civil rights laws be respected and enforced. And I also knew that the Oakland mayor would do just about anything to avoid having the OPD put under receivership during her watch. And so I decided to set a briefing schedule regarding the possible appointment of a receiver for the Oakland Police Department. But in addition, I ordered the parties to meet and confer, even as they were preparing their briefs for the receivership hearing. And I told them that if they could jointly come up with something that fell short of a receivership, but would still have more authority than the present monitoring team, I would give that some very serious consideration. And to my utter delight, my utter pleasure, the parties agreed to have additional oversight and power over the uh, OPD. They agreed that the monitors would have that additional power. Someone that they agreed would be called a compliance director who would be appointed by the court and would be answerable only to the court. The compliance director would have authority over the OPD with respect to everything related to the NSA. It could, he could order, or she, could order individual uh, expenditures of up to $250,000 and could discipline, demote, or remove the chief of police, the assistant chiefs, and deputy chiefs, subject to their right to appeal this decision to the court. The compliance director was, in almost every way but in name, a receiver. It's not possible in the time allotted me to review a case uh, that has been going on with close and determined monitoring for 18 years. And so in summation, Oakland Police Department is a better department, perhaps in spite of itself, than it was when the writer's case was filed. For one thing, a large percentage of its officers today have known only the improved practices agreed upon under the NSA and have never had to unlearn bad habits. Over all of these years, I've repeatedly told the defendants that you might as well do it right and do it now because I'm not going away. I'm here to stay. Well, truth is, I'm no longer here to stay. As I said, I've retired. But a much younger and a much more energetic young judge has the case now. We've talked about it at length, and he also will not go away. And Bob Warshaw and Charlie Reynolds are still around to show them that, yes, they really do understand how policing really works, and they also are not going away. Thank you once again for letting me talk to you today.